Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Death Metal Disco Podcast. Woo woo! That's how we do. By we, I mean me. It's just me. Um, I'm James. Thanks for checking it out again. If you have checked us out previously, or one previous episode, I say our. It's just me. I don't know why I keep doing that. It seems like that's how I should do it, though. So I do. Not gonna lie. I've been racking my brain trying to think of what I want to include and yap about relentlessly uh, in this episode. And I'm entirely sure that what I'm going to talk about is something I actually feel like talking about. But some of it is. So uh, I will say this. The Rona has got me all fucked up this year. Uh, It's got everybody fucked up, I'm pretty sure. And with the Rona and everything that's going on with it, I feel like dwelling on the past is normal for a lot of people, thinking of the better times. And I know for me, it for sure has. I'm constantly thinking about, oh, yesteryear, you know, pretty much any time before January of this year for me, uh, definitely before March of this year, um, seems like a better time than the rest of this year, for the most part. You know, before before all this, there were things to do. And, you know, the worst, you'd be like, oh, I might get hit by a car or something. But, you know, you didn't have to wear a mask to protect others. You didn't have to not see your family on Thanksgiving because you might get them sick and they might die or they might not die or you might get sick or vice versa, whatever. Just seemed to be easier for most of us prior to this year. I find myself thinking about all the things that have brought me to where I am today, which is currently in a closet that I have converted to be a makeshift voiceover booth. I say makeshift, it actually does a pretty good job, but anyway, not the point. Uh, I I look at my band, my current band, Empyrean Eclipse, uh, for which I am the vocalist, and we have been struggling for a long time with uh, making time to get together to write music, Uh, We only practice once a week, blah, blah, blah. We don't play very many shows, not counting this year. We don't play any shows this year, but uh, even before, we'd maybe play one or two shows a year, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm I'm often reminded about my first band, the band that got me into the uh, the local Colorado music scene, specifically the metal and death metal music scene in Colorado. Um... The basically the first band that I helped build, and we did a lot of things, and we were around for a little over five years, all in all, and I know a great deal of people now because of the things that we did in that band, and I'm going to talk about that for a little bit, if you don't mind. So this is a story all about how My life got flipped and it didn't really get turned upside down, nor did it get flipped. Uh, This is about my adventure into the death metal rabbit hole. And it's a great rabbit hole. If you get sucked into any kind of rabbit hole, I highly recommend this one. If you're a fan of music, I am, therefore I did. My first band started in 1999. We called ourselves Misanthrope. That was a name that my friend Jamie, who I've mentioned previously, he decided he wanted a band called Misanthrope. He played guitar. I didn't. I could fuck around on a bass a little bit. I could play some drums, not death metal quality drums. I could maybe get away with some sloppy new metal, you know, something. Considering I never practiced drums, I, I'd do okay if I needed to, but not death metal. That's too demanding for somebody who never practices. And... That's not what I wanted to do anyway. So when Jamie came to me asking if I was interested in uh, jamming, as it were, I said, sure, why not? So we'd go into his basement and fuck around playing different songs from different bands. He's the one who introduced me to death metal, or really got me going into death metal, I should say. And we didn't know what exactly we wanted to do. We started by randomly playing some typo negative songs. Um, Typo negative is awesome. And if you're not familiar with them, you should become familiar with them. Just don't expect new music. 
Rest in peace, Pete. We would fuck around playing with some white zombie songs, uh, mostly like Children of the Grave, the cover they did of the Black Sabbath song. And we did fuck around with some Black Sabbath. Pretty much anything that he could play, we fucked around doing. And it was just him on his little crate practice amp and me also singing through his crate practice amp. So it sounded probably pretty horrible, but it did what we needed to do at the time. And that was just, you know, have fun. Eventually, I don't I don't remember when, we had moved into his bedroom and brought our stuff up there uh, for a little bit. Or maybe that's where we started, I can't remember. But he had asked if I could do death metal vocals, specifically, kind of like Chris Barnes in early Cannibal Corpse. And I said, I don't know, let's give it a shot. And I tried it, and I couldn't go more than maybe a second or two without the tickle in my throat fucking me up, and it took a lot of uh, getting used to, but eventually I, I could do it, and seemed to do it relatively well, and that kind of kick-started everything off. Now, mind you, in 1999, uh, Barnes had moved on to six feet under full-time. I say moved on. He got fucking fired from Cannibal. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Anyway, uh, he was doing six feet under, and I loved the first six feet under album, Haunted. I thought it was great. Uh, the Bleeding by Cannibal Corpse also ranked extraordinarily high in my death metal repertoire, which at the time wasn't all that expansive, but... You know, I looked up to him vocally, and lyrically, I got a kick out of his lyrics because they were absurd and eccentric, and I am about both of those things a lot of the time, so it seemed to work out favorably that I would use him as an inspiration. So eventually, at some point, we started uh, writing our own songs. We knew that we wanted to write a song called Disgruntled, and we wanted to write a song uh, called Butchery about, you know autopsies, essentially, and uh, being torn up, and this, that, and the other. The typical 90s death metal. The style that we went with was essentially six feet under-ish. We had a lot of drop D tuning. Um, we we, call, we called ourselves death rock and not death metal because we were kind of groove-oriented. Um, we didn't have a drummer. We had a drum machine. We didn't have a bass player. Uh, we didn't have any of that shit. For the first six months or so, Maybe not even that long. Maybe just the first couple of months uh, that we actually got kind of serious about it. And our music wasn't groundbreaking or any of that. It wasn't technically amazing or, you know, like compared to the death metal bands of today. Uh, jump change. But, you know, people, we, we were happy with what we were doing. And that's all that mattered. We had started looking into possibly trying to play a show sometime. Just... Him and me, with no drummer, no bass player, was going to be a shit show. But we were like, hey, we should look into this. We should also maybe try and find a bass player and a drummer. I remembered in high school, the school I graduated from, uh, their art department every semester would put on a Battle of the Bands. I went to the Battle of the Bands once uh, my senior year, and it was actually a really good time. The bands were pretty impressive. It was, it was fun. It's for students. The bands have to have a student in the school. And you get to play, and people cheer you on, and it's in an auditorium on a nice stage, nice lights, blah, blah, blah. And that was cool. I mentioned this to Jamie, and he's like, dude, you should find out about it. So uh, one of the girls we worked with in the grocery store, um, she and I actually went to high school there together, but we never talked. I never met her, really. We were in band together. She played flute. I played tuba. She was across the room. I, you know... We'd catch glances of each other, and I always thought she was interesting, but she started working at King Super, so I was like, oh, well, at least, you know, I'm familiar with her existence, so I introduced myself and asked her about it, because uh, she was still in school, and she told us, oh, yeah, they still do it, uh, one member of the band has to be in the school, and gave us a little more of the rules, and while I was bummed that, you know, somebody had to be in the school still, it, I told her it was okay, because we still needed a bass player, and we didn't have a drummer. So then she said, oh, hey, I play bass. I said, oh, hey, you want to join a death metal band? And she said, maybe. And so I said, hey, you should come to this address on this day and jam with us and see what you think and go from there. And she did, and we liked it, and then we hired Addie. 
And Addie is one of my closest friends, 20-something years later. So we got Addie. Uh, we got Addie, and at the time we were also rocking a drum machine that Jamie spent quality time learning how to use and program. I tried to program that bitch, and I did not have the patience for that nonsense. That was some bullshit. I'm a pretty visual guy, so it didn't help that all of this was just... You had to use your imagination, and you had to program all this shit without even being able to see where you're putting all of these things, and I didn't, I didn't care for that at all. So I left the programming to him. Since the three of us worked at the grocery store, uh, we would actually have quite a lot of time to get together during the week and on the weekends to practice and work on material. So he'd show Addie what he had written, and she would take it and go with it, and I would write some lyrics, mostly the absurd, eccentric, gore-related lyrics, typical death metal, uh, zombies this, vampires that, blood and guts. I was 19, whatever. I, I make no excuses for it. It was easy to write, and I enjoyed writing awful, awful shit. So we practiced, practice, 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 and we got down a nifty little set. We had, I don't know, six or seven songs maybe, uh, including two covers. We covered Strip Angled by Cannibal Corpse and, and The Enemy Inside by Six Feet Under. Uh... With a drum machine, neither one of those sounded all that fantastic, but they didn't sound terrible. Like, it worked. You know, we couldn't program them to be perfect. We programmed them to be recognizable, and we're like, hell yeah. Now we gotta figure out trying to get some shows. Over the course of the summer of 1999, the three of us practiced a lot, and we're always together, and it was a great time. Come the start of the school year, Addie went back to school. It was her senior year, and... I'm a year older than her, I guess uh, two years older than her, maybe a year, I can't fucking do math right now, I'm not going to, uh, Jamie's a few years older than us, um, we asked her to find out about the Battle of the Bands and when it was, she gets back to us and says, oh, hey, the Battle of the Bands is uh, in November, I said, cool, we should play that, and she said, yeah, we should. And I agreed, and so we uh, we managed to get into the Battle of the Bands at the high school. And there were, I want to say, 11 bands total. And the rules were pretty specific. With that many bands, you only got 14 minutes. Maybe it was 15. 14 sounds super specific. But you only get 14 minutes to to actually set up play your songs, and tear down your shit before the next band was on, and you had to keep that schedule. We practiced. We had a big PA system. Um, we had Jamie had upgraded and got a pretty nifty uh, half stack and an amp, and we all kind of played through that. I played directly through the PA with my voice, and the drum machine went through directly the PA as well, and then Jamie and Addie both came out of his half stack. And we ended up figuring out how to mic that, how to wheel it around and get it pretty damn quick. And we had some friends come with us that would act as our roadies and stage crew, which was awesome. We got it. We figured that we could play four songs, totaling 11 minutes total. And that would give us basically, maybe we had 15 minutes. It would give us two minutes to set up and tear down. And everything was on caster, so we could just roll the whole fucking thing out. We'd already have it set up and ready to go, so then we roll it out, plug it in, boom, we're good to go. In two minutes, we start playing. And Jamie had programmed the drum machine to go song to song to song to song with zero stops. So we'd finish one, go right into the next one. It was actually a really fantastic way to do it, and we fucking killed it. We were the fourth band to play. We were the first band to actually make it through their entire allotted set time um, without any technical difficulties, any bullshit, anything like that, we played through the whole thing. And I don't remember much of when we were actually playing. My hair was in the way a lot. I was hot because I decided to wear a long sleeve shirt. But I do remember people were cheering. And Addie had a lot of friends in school still. None of them really knew me because I didn't make any friends when I was there. But people were cheering. And I thought that was the coolest fucking feeling in the world. At that time, aside from being the fat ass on stage with the microphone, I didn't have any real stage presence. I kind of copied uh, George Corpse Grinder's presence of just standing there and screaming at them. And it seemed to work. I'd headbang. And mostly I was just trying to control my nerves and my stage fright. 
and it seemed to go over well. People were cheering. Um, Jamie's mom got video of the whole thing. It was very, very dark. All you could see was the light on our faces, and uh, Jamie's half stack was kind of a beige color, so that stood out. And then the writing on my shirt stood out, and that was really about it. But our plan was to play three songs, three of our songs, and one cover song. And the cover song we did was The Enemy Inside by Six Feet Under. Simple song, but very catchy, and people would know it, especially because we knew that there were quite a few metalheads in the crowd there, the Addie's friends, uh, kind of on the goth, metal-y side. Um, we, we knew that people would know that, which was good, because they did. So anyway, we had a fantastic time, at least I did, and it felt good to be able to um, kind of control the crowd. I wasn't doing anything about, you know, let me hear you or show me your horns or any of that shit. Uh, it was my first show ever, and it was probably 150 people that came, which, I don't know, maybe it was less. It seemed like it was 150 people. I don't know how many people fit in that auditorium, but it was pretty packed. And it was awesome just hearing those screams and, you know, people cheering and whistling and clapping. It was a fantastic fucking feeling. And at that point, I was kind of hooked. So that was our first show. And still to this day, the funniest part about that show for me was before we actually got to play, the art teacher who was kind of directing the whole thing, putting it on for the art department, they wanted the lyrics to all of our songs submitted to them for review to make sure they're appropriate because it's a high school, which I get. So I basically took the four songs that we had and changed all their lyrics to be absolutely stupid, fluffy bunny shit. And say, oh, here's the lyrics to our songs. It's death metal. They're not going to understand it. And they didn't because the songs that we played were uh, a little more violent than the ones that we gave them as lyrics submitted. And we did that twice. We played the Battle of Bands two times. And uh, that first time we actually took third out of 11 bands. The first two bands, I don't remember their names. Dismemberment was one, and I can't remember the second one. They were more of like a pop punk kind of band from what I remember. And, you know, it's a battle of the bands. Those are always popularity contests. And all of the people in both of those bands still went to the school. So you're kind of guaranteed to not do all that well compared to them. But the fact that we took third out of 11, that was pretty fucking good feeling. I like that. After that show, you know, we packed up all of our shit, uh, loaded it out with our roadies. Thanks, Nick and Nate and Ben and my mom and Chris, everybody who came. Uh, and then we went to, I think we went to IHOP. And it was several hours later and we're walking into IHOP and another car was coming through the parking lot. And somebody was like, fucking misanthrope, yeah, about all the bands. And I was like, hell yeah, I could get used to this shit. And we, I mean, that was, to me, that was almost better than playing the show. Just that recognition several hours later outside of the show in a parking lot. And from then on, you know, it was a tale as old as time. I just couldn't get enough of the death metal vocalizing lifestyle. So from there, uh, we played a real show at a bar with a band from Wyoming called Side and another local band called Bleeding Faith. And those two had been around for quite a few years before we actually played with them. And we opened for them playing with our killer drum machine, small venue, first first actual venue. And, uh, you know, that was fun. It was all right, I guess, you know. We got to play a real show, and that was good. We didn't have the screaming, cheering, but people cheered. You know, they clap after songs, which is better than silence, because I've played to silence before. And it was good. It was good to actually see some other local bands who people knew and recognized and getting tips and pointers from them. And I'm friends with those people to this day. It's been 20, 20 years now. I think that was probably in, that was probably in 2000, that show. So it's been about 20 years. So after, after that magical first show of the school and then slightly less magical show of the bar, uh, we kept playing. We played a lot. We ended up uh, losing Addy. Um, we, there was a little miscommunication on my part. Shit got awkward. Uh, she quit, and that's fine. We had a little bit of a falling out, her and I. Uh, we have since mended that, and 
like I said, she's one of my closest friends and love her to death. So, Addie, if you're listening, what's up, girl? So after that, we had some staffing issues. Chris, Jamie's brother, who I've spoken about, uh, decided to teach himself the bass, and he caught on really, really well. Like, I was pleasantly surprised by um, his dedication to it. And he joined up, and through a girlfriend, the girl I was dating in 2001, we ended up getting a second guitar player and a drummer, uh, Chuck and Oliver. Uh, Chuck played guitar. He was a thrash guitarist, a shredder, loved to shred. Not really a death metal guy, but he could play whatever the hell we needed done. And Oliver, and Oliver, solid drummer, solid guys, hung out with them several times before we had them in the band. So now we were a five-piece, and it was great to actually hear our songs with a a second guitar part filling it out and an actual drummer. Actual drummers are way better than programmed drum machine, even though this day and age, programmed drums, it's kind of hard to tell a lot of the time. Unless it's fucking ridiculous, like mortician. Uh, But drum programming these days is way more realistic than drum programming in 1999. So, it's cool. We played so many shows. So many shows. Lots of different bands. We played a lot with the same bands. It just worked out that way. We would always book shows with a band called Apathy. Uh, Fantastic band. Love them to death. Their vocalist, Brian Ortiz Jr., probably my favorite vocalist in the Denver area, um, in Colorado. Still is. I don't know if he jams much anymore. He was in a band called Stratagem. They took hiatus. I don't know if they're still happening at all, but I hope they are, because I liked them a lot. We went on until about 2005. In 2005, after losing our drummer again, um... We had, we'd gone through a few drummers over the course of three years, three or four years, and finally we played another show in June of 2005 that turned out to be our last show. And at that time, I had already accepted a position as the vocalist for another melodic band in Colorado, a melodic death metal band uh, called The Mandrake. And they were well-established. I liked them a lot. Their original singer, Jay Ryan, well second singer, I guess, Jay Ryan. I really, really liked him. Um, Ended up taking his place. That was awkward. Don't want to talk about that. But I got into that band and did some stuff with them for a couple of years. And then they decided they wanted to go in a different direction, and I was out. And at that point, which was the end of 2006, uh, I decided I was going to take some time and not do band stuff. I didn't want to be in a band. I was starting a new job as a police dispatcher. The job was going to be very stressful getting trained, and my schedule was going to be stupid, and I wouldn't have any seniority, so I couldn't get time off to do shit. So if I had to work Friday night, I had to work Friday night or Saturday night. There was no way of getting around that, so I was like, I don't need to be in a band. And I'd been doing it up to this point now. That was 2006, the end of 2006, going into 2007 is when I started the dispatching job. So I was like, all right, it's been a good seven, eight years, time for a break. So fast forward a couple more months into 2007, specifically into February, so really just you know a month and a half, two months, I get an email from another band out of Fort Collins, a technical melodic death metal band, and they were looking for a vocalist. They had seen me play when I was in the Mandrake, and they liked what I did, and they were asking if I'd be interested in checking them out and possibly joining up. I said, no, not at this time, uh, not looking for a band right now, got a lot going on, um, you know, best of luck. Well, the guitar player who messaged me, Ryan, via MySpace, he's like, man, don't blow us off. Come up, check us out, hang out for a little while, see what we're doing. And if you still want to say no, that's totally okay. We get it. But don't don't say no without at least hearing it. And I said, okay, fine, I'll come up and we'll go from there. So anyway, I went up to Fort Collins and met the guys and they blew me the fuck away. When I walked in and Dave was sitting on the ground playing The Angel's Venom by Monstrosity, I knew I came to a place that I would have a hard time saying no to, and I joined a little band called Allegiance. Uh, After about a year, they changed the name, we changed the name, and shortly after that I left the band, because they wanted to go do big things, and I was burned the fuck out. The Mandrake did well, it was hard for me to adjust to having a new band that people didn't know, 
not to mention a band with fantastic musicians that people would just stand and stare at in complete awe, including me, of their performances. So I left the band and I said, hey, if you guys don't go do big things, it's your own fucking faults. And now that it's been 13 years, well, 12 years, I guess, since I left the band, I left in 2008, they have done very big things and continue to do very big things. And I could not be more proud of Greg, who was in the band when I was in the band. He took over for Dave after we got rid of Dave. And he's the only one that's still there, but I'm super, super stoked for everything they do and have done and will do. And they carry on very nicely. So after that little stint as the vocalist for that band, I did finally take my hiatus. Uh, my schedule got super fucked over at work in Dispatch because I went to help a friend during our shift bid, and it went terribly awry in my favor. Uh, or not in my favor, I guess. It didn't go well for me. I got fucking shafted, and the following six months were going to be bad. So in 2009, uh, Ryan from Empyrean Eclipse, who had been on hiatus for two years, hit me up and asked if I would if I would be interested in joining up with them. And I said, well, shit's wrong right now. Hit me up in six months. You know, I'll let you know. So that's happened. Uh, six months go by. I come down, and we'd played shows with these guys before when I was in the Mandrake, and they were always great. I was always a fan from their first CD. I was fucking super huge into that first CD. And turns out... Uh, they liked what they heard when I finally did audition, and that's been now 10 years. Well, technically 11 years. Uh, again, that's just that's just a little history of those other bands. Maybe I'll talk about those other bands in detail at some point, but I kind of wanted to keep this just to a how did I get started in the death metal local scene? We'll call this an origin story. That's what we'll call this misanthrope an origin story so you've been listening to me ramble on for quite some time about this that and the other so allow me to ramble on briefly about how i operate this podcast there's lots of options for how you want to post and host your podcast and you put it out into the world uh i did a lot of research on mine and for me i decided to go with anchor.fm if you haven't heard of Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's free. That was a big selling point to me. Free is good. Uh, I like free. There's also tools for creation to help you record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer or your tablet or whatever you're using. I find that to be effective. So we got free. We got uh, recording and editing. Both big deals uh, because they are. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify. It could be heard on Apple Podcasts, it could be heard on Google Podcasts, and many, many more. That is a huge time saver because I don't have to go to each of those things to upload. So I like that distribution right then and there. And again, it's free. You can make money from your podcast, if you're into that kind of thing, with no minimum listenership. That could be cool. I think you should try it. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you've been on the fence about making a podcast and the only thing holding you back is how you want to host it or create it or whatever, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's worth it. So now that I have probably bored most of you to death with my death metal beginnings, um, I want to talk about something a little more personal. I did not plan on talking about this at all uh, prior to actually coming in here and you know pressing the record button, but I'm here. And I'm just going to bring it up. It's going to be quick. It's more on a personal personal level than anything I've discussed so far. Uh, but here we go. Let's talk about interpersonal relationships. Specifically, the romantic, physical, intimate relationships. Whether there's actual physical aspects to a relationship, be it a friend's situation or an actual relationship relationship, or just casual dating, whatever. Um, I have questions. In the course of my adult life, I have had only three serious relationships with ladies. And, uh, I mean, the problem is me, and that's fine. I accept that. One of these days I'll figure out what it is, and I'll work on that. 
But here is here is what I'm proposing, and I'm going to ask a couple questions to get feedback from you. And if you would find the podcast on Twitter, it's at Death Disco Pod, all one word at Death Disco Pod, or on uh, Facebook under the Death Metal Disco Podcast. Uh, we don't have an Instagram set up yet, but I'm going to ask the questions. And if you hear this and you get to this, tweet me back an answer, uh, message me on Facebook, a comment on Facebook, whatever. Uh, I'm just interesting to I'm just interested to hear what people think as far as what is worse, and I'll explain that now. So maybe not what is worse, but what is uh, least awful versus most awful. We'll call it that, just because I don't want it to sound like a shit show, which it is. But anyway, that's okay. Historically, I have found myself in a position where I will be very attracted to a lady. Uh, Physical attraction, usually notwithstanding. um, Emotional connection, that type of thing. I am very drawn to, to a girl, and I... Don't necessarily make it clear that I am, um, but I don't necessarily hide it. And eventually get shut down when I do present this, hey, I'm into you, whatever, however I do it, get shot down. Um, That always sucks. Nobody likes being rejected for really anything. Uh, Matters of the heart typically are worse because obviously it's your heart. So I've had that several times. And usually the issue is they don't feel the same way. And that's fine. Whatever. I'll get over it. Uh, But that sucks. I've also been in the situation where more recently this year, uh, I have found myself in a situation where I've met a girl who I like a lot. And we get along great. And the witty banter between the two of us is fantastic to me. And witty banter is something that turns my mind on a lot, and that means more to me than physique or anything else, really. Literally, if, if you can banter with me and, uh, you know, talk shit and receive the shit talking and vice versa in super good form, I'm going to be a fan of yours, and I am. And we've spoken quite a lot, and we click, there's a vibe, and she admitted to me, that she, well, I, I kind of have a crush on you. And I said, well, I kind of have a crush on you. The problem with this information is that she's in a loving, committed relationship. And I can't do anything about that. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to intervene, interject myself where I don't belong. I, I will happily be friends and stay friends. But this is a first for me. I've never been in this mutual attraction uh, situation where they're currently in a good relationship. Um... I have been the rebound more times than I can think of, and I recently saw a shirt that says I don't date anymore, I just foster women until they find their forever home, and that's basically what I've been saying for the last 20 years. And regardless of whatever happens between the two of us and this whole uh, situation, I think we will always be very good friends, uh, at minimum. I don't... I don't see that ever changing, and that's cool. It's just weird territory for me, so I had to actually get that off my chest um, anonymously to everybody who might be listening to this, all six of you, or however many actually are. I appreciate all six of you, even if it's more than six. But I want to know, have you been in similar situations? Um, My relationship experience, romantic relationship experience, is, like I said, I've only been in three committed, serious relationships Over the course of my adult life, uh, my best actual relationship was probably to a girl named Nicole when I was in fifth grade, and that was most of the school year. So that says everything to know about that. If you've been in anything like this, um, hit me up on the Twitter, the Twitter, because I'm old apparently, at Death Disco Pod, uh, Facebook, the Death Metal Disco Podcast. You can even message me on the Anchor.fm app. Or website if you're using that. Um, That's the link I post to on Twitter and Facebook and all that jazz. Hit me up. Let me know what's up. Um, 
Let me know if you've been in similar situations to any of those things. I'm sure most people have. It's just something that's been on my mind recently, and I don't not know what to do, but I don't know what to do, if that makes any sense at all. Mostly I just look for people who are uh, in that same boat right now. Um, So anyway, share this with your friends. I appreciate you listening to the Death Metal Disco podcast. Uh, Again, I'm James. Super grateful for you. Thanks for listening to me ramble for a long time. And I will uh, talk to you guys again very soon. And share this with your friends. If there's a like button, you should hit the like button. I don't say the word smash that like button because everybody fucking says smash that like button. If you want to leave a review or leave feedback, anything I could do differently, could do better. Uh, This is, we're on it. I'm in my infancy of a podcast and I don't know what it's going to be yet. So uh, hit me up if you have suggestions, suggested topics. Suggested topics would be fantastic. Give me something to talk about. Uh, Right now, I'm not keeping it too serious, as you can tell, Um, but eventually we'll go down that road, I have no doubt. So thanks for listening. Be safe. Love you all.